in the parking lot. We're glad it's a little bit cooler. And even though it's a little smoky out here in uh, Northern California, we want to welcome those who are joining us. Also our friends who are joining us online across the country and around the world. Uh, we are grateful that you have chosen to study with us and uh, share and praise together for our worship service. We do have some announcements we'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, just a reminder, if you have your bulletins, our Tuesday evening Bible study, it happens at 7 o'clock. It is an online Bible study, so we would encourage you to join us for that. It's at the Granite Bay Facebook page. And then for those who can, tomorrow we're going to be having a special work bee right here at our church sanctuary. And you'll notice uh, in the announcement it says, uh, the church work bee cleansing the sanctuary with no disappointment. For you Adventists, you probably understand what that is. But we are going to be cleansing our sanctuary. We're getting closer to uh, hopefully getting the permits where uh, we can start utilizing the building a little bit more. So that's going to be happening at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So come along and join us. If you have some cleaning supplies, you can bring that along as well. We are going to have a lot of additional cleaning supplies here. It'll be uh, vacuuming, dusting, cleaning the windows, uh, some mopping. So that's going to be at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, and we will be serving you lunch at noon tomorrow. So we want to encourage you to come be a part of that. Also want to remind you about uh, the Young Adult Sabbath School that happens in the morning, Sabbath morning at uh, 9 a.m. And that, of course, happens here. Also, notice Amazing Facts is in need of some volunteers. So if you're able to volunteer helping in the Bible School or some of the other areas, you can contact the number that we have there. And then if you're not getting our emails and our church update, it's very important that you sign up for the church updates because there are changes. Times might change or we might be moving location and we want you to know about that. So please send your email to office at granitebaysda.org so you're going to be able to get the various updates that we have. And then something very exciting that we're looking forward to. It's still a little ways away, October the 23rd, but we're going to be doing a special uh, evangelistic series, a full evangelistic series, and it's entitled Revelation Now. We're looking at some of the most important, some of the most fascinating prophecies in the book of Revelation, and uh, we're going to have it right here, hopefully either in the new church or maybe in the Amazing Facts studio, but it's going to be broadcast and it's a great opportunity for you to connect with your neighbors, your friends, to tell them about it. It'll be an online as well as in-person, uh, hopefully, event. And uh, you'll hear more about that. If you'd like to learn more, just visit revelationnow.com and you'll be able to get more information about that. Well, again, we want to thank you for joining us here for our Granite Bay Church Worship Praise in the Parking Lot. And as we get started, we'd like to invite you to stand, and we're going to sing our call to worship. You'll see the words printed in the bulletin. It's, We Have This Hope. Let's stand as we sing. Loving Father, it is a joy to be able to come together with brother, brothers and sisters here uh, locally in the uh, parking area and uh, this place dedicated to your worship. And also we know that we have um, friends and brothers and sisters that are at various places around North America and other parts of the world and that are also worshiping right now. We pray that your spirit will come into this place, 
Be with every heart and every mind. We pray, Lord, that um, you'll be glorified in, in the word, in the proclamation, that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts and that we'll all be transformed for the better as a result. And we pray for your angels to be present. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you all. It's nice to be able to be here. We are uh, coming to that time, or have come to that time in our worship here this particular week in Sabbath, where we have opportunity to return our tithes and our offerings. I know that there are so many different options that we have nowadays. I know myself and my family now have uh, become quite accustomed to giving online, and, uh, and many of you are as well. But some of us are still writing checks and giving cash in different ways as God continues to bless us and increase our increase. Because of time restraints, I don't have time to go into details. I know that most of us are familiar with the, with the story of Jacob and uh, with his life experience, especially in those first years um, when he had uh, blown it in a very large way. And he found himself getting into a bit of a dishonest conspiracy with his mother. They had uh, forgotten that uh, the means is just as important as the end. And, uh, and so they had uh, kind of compromised the means, and they were a little bit dishonest, well, a lot dishonest with Dad. And, uh, and he pretended that he was Esau. He received the blessing, and, uh, and they thought everything was going to be the good. They didn't quite connect the dots far enough to recognize that his older, stronger uh, uh, brother might not be happy with the arrangement. And uh, so we find that uh, Jacob finds himself uh, fleeing for his life. And when he gets to a place that was originally called Luz, he finds himself, it's after dark, he's tired, he's exhausted, he's discouraged, he's mad at himself, uh, he's uh, probably not exactly excited about his mother and her influence on him at this point and the aftermath of it. But uh, in spite of it all, when he goes to sleep that night, God gives him a dream. And when he receives that dream, he sees this ladder that is extended all the way from earth to heaven. And the Lord's at the top of the ladder. He's the Lord of the ladder. And there's these angels descending and ascending upon the ladder, of course, giving great encouragement, needed encouragement to this man that was uh, full of discouragement and uh, shame and a number of other emotions that he was dealing with. And so the Lord says, I will be with you. And my angels will continue to ascend and descend from heaven to be able to minister to you. And I will keep you. And I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will preserve you. And I will bring you back to the very place that you were sleeping on. He was sleeping on the ground at the time with a rock for a pillow. And so he was not in good, he was not in good straits. He was in a very desperate situation. God says, the very land in which you are sleeping on, I'm going to give you your descendants. And the descendants will be as the dust of the ground in number. And so God gives them a lot of needed encouragement that day. And now the uh, ball is in, in um, Jacob's uh, court at this time. And so, uh, you know, he has to make a choice. How is he going to respond to the Lord and his graciousness, incredible graciousness that was offered to him at that point? And so I'd like to read with you uh, that particular uh, response as we go to, uh, or as I go to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, we find in verse 20 the response of Jacob. Fortunately, he had made a very good and positive response. Then Jacob made a vow. And he's saying, if God will be with me, and in other words, if he's going to do everything that he just said he's going to do, this is the kind of God I want to continue to serve. Now, this is not a new God to Jacob, of course. This is not a new relationship with him, but he's renewing his vow after he had, uh, had failed God in a very serious way. And he's saying, if God will be with me and, and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, in other words, in reflection of the promises that he just made to me, if he's going to do all that and even help, help me to come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth or a tithe uh, to you. 
And, uh, and so we find a very positive response of Jacob. It reveals that uh, from the very beginning of God's people, in the very first chapters of the very first book of the Bible, we find here that there was a principle. There was a very direct uh, connection between those who were giving their hearts and their lives to the true God of heaven, that were offering themselves in worship and surrender to him, that were making God the Lord of their life, that they would return to him a tithe. Now, later on through the servant Moses, some hundreds of years later, we find that God clarified that even further, at least in Scripture, and went from an oral tradition as far as being transferred of this truth to a written Holy Scripture that tells us that the reason that God had always called and his people had offered a tithe is because it tells us that it's the Lord's money in the first place. And so he puts it in our hands and says, now it's up to you. If I'm truly your Lord then you will return a tenth of all that I give you back to me. And, uh, and so we're not really returning. We're not giving our tithe. We're returning our tithe. Do you see the difference, friends? After that, it's offerings. And now we give after that tenth. But the first tenth that we give is actually returning something that already belongs to God. And uh, so this morning we have opportunity to do that. Some of us are doing it throughout the week or afternoon when we come uh, online and such. Uh, there's so many different options, but at this point we're going to take an option, even an opportunity right now. So let's pray over the offering as the deacons prepare to do that this morning. Father in heaven, this morning we thank you for the opportunity again to come to your word, to worship you. We thank you so much for the offerings and the tithe that you bring into our life, that we might be able to return that tenth that belongs to you back to you in faith and recognizing you as the Lord and the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And Father in heaven, we also want to pray that you will bless this money, that it will be used as wisely as possible, that you will expand it, multiply it, and help it to truly increase your kingdom and to save souls for the kingdom and help as many people as possible to be ready and to anticipate your soon coming. And so, Father, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. While the deacons are taking their offerings, I was going to share some good news as well uh, that we had received from the conference. And that is uh, they just got the year-to-date uh, report on the um, tithe that has been returned in the Northern California Conference, which is where we live here. And uh, compared to last year at this time, at least as of the end of July, the tithe amount returned is only 0.19% less than it was last year. And, uh, and so in spite of all the challenges that we've been facing economically and with the pandemic and such, uh, God is still blessing his church and he knows that it is time and opportunity for us to be able to use that fund, those funds to be able to continue to move the kingdom forward and prepare for the coming of Jesus. God bless you. Aranata. Amen. Woo! Let's see. I have a children's story. Where are all the kids today? Raise your hand. Where are all the kids? I only see children raising their hands. Look at all the grumpy adults. Right? All right. There you go. Look at the little one over there. You know, I was I was doing a uh, yesterday I was yesterday morning I was doing a Zoom meeting in in Dubai, and uh, I was amazed because. Before I, I got to, to preach, this little six-year-old with her parents, with her sister, she, uh, you know, I was a little, uh, I was a little going through some situations, so my head was a little bit uh, uh, foggy at the moment, and this little girl came up and she just started to sing, and it was the most beautiful thing. She, this little girl inspired me. I, my, I almost had tears coming down to see the love that she had for Jesus and her little sister there and see the family uh, singing together as they as they caught up with the with the daughter and it just inspired me and so I think it's beautiful that when you see little children love God and see the pureness of their hearts it's a blessing for us amen and so uh, I told her next time that I that I if they invite me to preach again I said I want her to to have the opening song and to begin so no that's not the children's story just in case but that's just a little teaser I just wanted to share with you so there's the story of this this homeless beggar right he lived in this kingdom, and he was just, you know, he had the, the most raggedy clothes. He, uh, he, he didn't shower. He, didn't, he, he wasn't shaved. 
he didn't have he didn't have anything right he lived on the street he was homeless and it's interesting because the king of that of that kingdom he had actually died and his son had become king and of course this king wasn't a very good king um and so uh this this beggar he was walking down the streets one day and uh and he sees the chariot of of uh, what he appeared to be a kingly chariot, right? With, with all the horses and all the, the entourage and the escorts. And it was, it was the new king, right? And see, so he was amazed. He said, I wonder if this is the new king. And he says, maybe I'll ask him for something and maybe he'll give me, you know, he'll give me something. Maybe he'll give me some coins, gold coins, whatever it is. Maybe he'll give me something. And so as the chariot grew closer and closer and closer, the young, the, the, the young homeless beggar, he went up and, and, and he, he went up to the chariot and the, and the little curtain was pulled. And so the beggar pulled his hand inside of the, of the chariot as of asking, you know, could you give something please to this poor homeless beggar? And, uh, and so the king put his head out and he says, no, I don't have anything for you right now. I want, what are you going to give me? I want something from you. And so the beggar was like, what? This is ridiculous. He was insulted, right? How is this king with all of this money and all these riches? How is it possible that he could ask me when he has, right? He is the, the owner of this kingdom and he's asking me. And he looked at him and he was, he says, are you, are you serious? And the king said, yes. What do you have to offer to your king? What can you give your king? And so disgusted the homeless man, he, he went into his bag and he had three pieces of bread. Three pieces of bread, a little bit old probably, and that's all he really had, and he gave it to the king. He says, there you go. And he walked off, and he was just aggravated. He was very furious with the new king. And then as he kept on walking, the chariot kept on and came up behind him. And the king said, why did you leave? I didn't tell you to go. I said, I have something for you now. You have given me these three pieces of bread, and now I have something for you. And so the king gave him three nuggets of gold. Three nuggets of gold that those nuggets of gold would have helped for him to be fed, to be clothed, and to put a roof over his head and maybe even to start a business. And so he was amazed and marveled at what this king had done. And so when I look at this story, I thought about my king has given me everything I need. My king has given me everything. And my question then is, what have I given my king? Right? What am I doing for my Lord? If he has given me life, if he has given me this kingdom, what am I giving life? Right? Maybe I don't have all the riches of the world because God is the owner of silver and gold, right? What do I have to offer for God if God has everything? Well, you know what we have, my loved ones? To offer for God, we have to love, respect, obedience, ministering to other people, helping those in need, reaching out. And whatever we invest, notice the greatest thing that we can give God is never going to be enough for what he has given us. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, and this quote just stands out to me all the time in Matthew 19, 29, he says, when everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Amen? And so I want you to contemplate and think about it. How can I, in gratitude and in love and in honoring what God has given to me, how can I give back to? How can I help those that are around me? How can I be a positive, positive influence and show others who my king is and who my Lord is? Amen? And so I hope that's your desire. I know that is my desire. Not to obtain anything, but because we have already obtained everything through Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you because, uh, because of your love, your grace, your mercy, your patience. And we know that all of these things are manifested and greatly demonstrated through your son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you, Father, because there's nothing that we need. You have promised that you will give and you will supply our basic needs in every way, shape, or form. And so we ask, us for, we ask you, Father, that you help us to be impressed in our hearts to always want to give back to those that don't know of you because we are your feet, we are your hands, and that they may know us, 
They may know you through us, and they can see the love, the generosity through our acts, through our words, and they may come to want to know you better through us. We thank you, Father. We thank you for this blessing and for the great privilege of being princes and princesses, heirs to the throne of heaven. And we know that all of this is possible through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody says, amen. God bless everybody. Happy Sabbath. Please stand for scripture reading. 
Our scripture reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 33, verses 16 to 22. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. Please remain standing. I invite you to sing with me as we prepare our hearts for prayer. carpet here this morning and uh, so I'll be the only one kneeling with us here this morning I invite you to continue to stand as we lift our hearts our minds up to the Lord in prayer for those who are watching and joining us online locally and across the country we want to invite you to kneel whatever possible father in heaven is I kneel in the place of each and every one of us, and as we kneel before you in our hearts, we come before you as the Lord of heaven and earth. We come to you acknowledging and understanding that you are the ones that made the heavens and the earth and that you are older than eternity. We thank you, Lord, that you are the beginning and the end. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Father in heaven, we come to you recognizing that you are the one that helps our heart to continue to beat you are the one that gave us the breath of life through our first father. And you are the one that continues to give us the breath of life. Lord, we recognize that you are the one that giveth and the one that taketh away. Lord, we are the ones that recognize that you have given the greatest gift to us that you will never take away. And that is the son, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. His life his death on the cross, as he paid that penalty for our guilt and for our sin and for our shame. And then when he resurrected to life, to glory, as the first fruits of the promise that you have given to us, that each and every one of us, whether we see the grave in this life or we live to see Jesus come in glory, that all of us will find ourselves raised to glory. Lord, we look forward to that time when we can share in your glory and be fully recreated into your image once again. Father in heaven, we come together in this morning in that hope. And we pray, God in heaven, that you will hear our prayers to this morning as we give ourselves to you in faith once again. We worship you, Lord. We surrender to you, Lord. We give our hearts to you. We give our obedience to you. We give our very lives to you and acknowledge you as for all that you are. We pray, God in heaven, that you will forgive us our sins and that you will help us to continue to overcome sin as you work through us, both to will and to do your good pleasure. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promise that you give to us that when we come before you and worship and ask for you to write your 
law and your word upon our hearts, Father, that you will recreate us and continue to help us to shine brighter and brighter and reflect the very character and love of yourself and your son, Jesus. We pray, Father in heaven, God, that you will be with each and every person that is struggling in different ways. Lord, you know that some of us are in the hospital dealing and struggling with illnesses. Some of us find ourselves being stricken by the results of sin at home with different illnesses. Some of us are recuperating and recovering from injuries. Father, some of us are just plain old exhausted and have a hard time getting out of bed today. Father in heaven, we want to pray that you will revive us and recover us as we come to worship you and as we, we rest on the Sabbath that you have given to us. We pray, God in heaven, that you will lift us up and refresh us and re-strengthen us that we will find our hope and our strength renewed because of our time with you. Father in heaven, we pray that you will heal us for those of us who are recovering and dealing with different illnesses, injuries. And Father in heaven, we want to pray, God, that you will continue to help us to be able to do your mission and fulfill your commission to us to bring the gospel as a witness to all nations and all the world so that the end can come that Jesus can be found in glory face to face before us, Lord, and that you can deliver us once and for all from sin and the results of sin in a sinful world. Lord, we just look so forward to that time when you can deliver us. Father, please send your son soon and help us to be able to do our part in hastening that coming. Father in heaven, we want to pray that you will bless our pastor today. We thank you so much for Pastor Doug Batchelor. We thank you for the word that you have given to him again today. And Father, we want to pray that you will uphold him and give him the strength that you have so many times before to be able to clearly and with a spirit-led heart, Father, bring that message before us today. Help us to take it to heart. May it strengthen us. May it, may it increase our knowledge and our power that is found in you. May we receive that power, God, from your word today. And Father in heaven, we want to pray that you will be with us through this worship, and we thank you for listening. In Jesus' name we pray these things, God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Praise the Lord. It's a little cooler today. Can you say amen? amen. And uh, we don't really have uh, any clouds, but we have smoke protecting us from the rays of the sun. I want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online, or maybe you're um, watching on AFTV. We're just glad that uh, you could join us here. We're meeting now in the Granite Bay Hilltop Church parking lot. And uh, gives us um, a little safer environment. Uh, but I do hear some good news that in the next couple of weeks, at least in our county, they plan to start opening up the restaurants and ostensibly the churches. And so I'm sure we'll get more word on that. And uh, we, we just got word. You, you folks notice we got our new stone there in the fountain. Yeah. So isn't that nice? And I want to thank Sam Devi for that. And we got our uh, sign off on the inspection on the elevator yesterday, so we're making progress. God willing. We, we say, Lord, don't come yet. Our church isn't done. But God willing, soon <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be in the new building. You know, our message today, I think, is uh, relevant for the times in which we're living. Holding on to hope when harassed by hell. And, uh, of course, I'm using that word in the classic biblical sense. Uh, all of us sometimes feel like we're being harassed by the enemy, and uh, we can be tempted to feel hopeless, especially during the times like this where the whole world seems disrupted by uh, the pandemic and the, the volatility and economy and jobs and, and what's happening with um, uh, everything from fires and hurricanes around the country and uh, just this social unrest and the political polarization going on that uh, some people be begin to despair. Uh, maybe in your life, you've been just struggling in your relationship with the Lord and struggling with the same thing for years, and you wonder, 
how long it can go on, and you can be tempted to feel hopeless. But I think it's important that uh, folks are reminded the Bible is full of hope. I don't know if you caught it in the scripture reading that Emily shared, but three times in that passage it talked about our hope is in God, our hope is in God. Hope is one of the most crucial elements in the Christian life. Right up there with faith and love, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, now abides faith, love, and hope. And so we need all three of those. And so um, we're going to look at a story in the Bible that helps to illustrate this. And if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, go to Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And uh, th we're going to be looking at three different examples of this. And we're going to spend most of our time exploring this story about someone who was on the brink of hopelessness and how Jesus became the answer for them. Uh, while you're finding that passage, and, and this is going to be a Bible study, so I hope you have your Bibles either digitally or the uh, paper, paper versions. I remember reading in 1929 in the early days of submarines that uh, off the shore of Massachusetts there was an accident where a submarine just had its periscope above water and a, another merchant ship did not see it and there was a direct collision. Well, water began to come into one of the chambers and the submarine sank in about 100 feet of water and um, trapping the crew, they were able to seal off most of the sub and, but uh, they just did not have the technology back then to quickly raise a submarine. Well, the Navy did send some vessels to the site and they lowered some divers and, you know, back then the divers went down and they had these, like, heavy suits with the metal helmets. And uh, the Navy diver down there on the seafloor next to the submarine, he put his helmet up against the sub, and it worked like a stethoscope. He could hear the men tapping inside. And being a good Navy man, he still understood Morse code. And they were tapping out the message, is there any hope? Before their air ran out, is there any hope? Well, unfortunately for them, they just were not able to get to them in time. But that really is the question of the age right now. People are wondering, is, is there any hope? Is it just going to keep getting worse and worse? Well, I promise you someday it's going to get better. It may get worse before it gets better. But, you know, the Bible tells us that there is hope. I love that passage. It may not be uh, your favorite, but I like it, that a living dog is better than a dead lion. For all the living, there is hope is what Solomon said, for all the living. Where there's life, there's hope. You've heard that expression? That's where it comes from. Where there's life, there's hope. So let's look at our passage. And you know what I'd like to do before I kind of break it down for you and, and do some expository teaching? I want to just read through it. So go with me to Mark chapter 9. And uh, we're going to begin with verse 14. And it tells us here, and this is taking place, just to give you the context, this is taking place after Jesus has had this memorable experience on the Mount of Glory, the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John go up there with Jesus. Moses appears. Elijah appears. Christ is glorified. God the Father is shielded in the clouds and speaks and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. They're coming down the mountain after this mountaintop experience. You've heard that phrase before. We went to the retreat and camp meeting. We had a mountaintop experience. It comes from that passage in the Bible. And um, so they're coming down from this mountaintop experience. And it was during that time they come down to the valley. And you, know, you can't always stay up there on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. And when he came to the disciples, now they come to the other nine disciples, <laughs> Jesus comes like Moses off the mountain to find out that his church is in turmoil. And he comes to the disciples and he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them. And immediately when they saw him, they were all um, greatly amazed and they went running. They're kind of confounded. They're, they're uh, disturbed. They run to him and they greet him and they and he asks the scribes, what are you discussing? And the word there is, what are you disputing with the, the disciples, the apostles? Well, you know, they, they took advantage of the opportunity of Christ being gone. They were always trying to undermine Jesus before the apostles and to get them to question their faith or to undermine him for the crowds. They were jealous of the popularity and the authority and the power of Christ. And Jesus said, all right, you're talking to my, uh, my beloved here. What are you discussing with them? 
Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, and he gnashes his teeth, and he becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then they brought him. And when he saw him, when the de demon-possessed young man saw Jesus, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground, and he wallowed, foaming at the mouth, so that he asked his father, as the boy is in the middle of this conniption fit, he said, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. And often it has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, do you hear his hopeless plea? If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible for him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So there you have it in Mark. Now, friends, this is one of the few places in the Bible. Mark is usually the Reader's Digest version of the disciples. This is the one time where Mark gives more insight than the others. You'll also find it in Matthew and Luke. There's no reference to this story in John. But if you go to Matthew chapter 17 and you go to verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling. Matthew adds that he came kneeling. And he said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic. And he suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And Jesus said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. And then the disciples came to Jesus and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you that if you've got faith like a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here and it will be done. It will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. And now we go to Luke. And in Luke chapter 9 and in verse uh, 37, now it happened on the next day that when they had come down from the mountain, this tells us that they spent the night up there, that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look at my son, for he is the only child. Luke adds that it's his only son. And behold, the spirit seizes him, and suddenly he cries out, and it convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him, leaving him with great difficulty, bruising him. So when he has these fits, he gets injured. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and then gave him back to his father. He delivered him to his father. And then it says, when everyone was marveling, Jesus said, let these words sink into your heart. The son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand what he was saying. So it's interesting that in Matthew and Luke, after this experience, Christ reveals he's going to go die on the cross. So here you have a picture in the Bible of a father. The mother's not mentioned. Father has an only son. 
and the only son is in a hopeless state. He may be an attractive boy. He might be a bright boy. He might have been a um, healthy in other respects. He could talk and play with other children, but there was this spirit, and it calls it a deaf and a dumb spirit, because when he went through these seizures, he could not speak, he could not hear, he was lost to the world, and he would thrash. Sometimes he'd fall off in the water. He'd fall off if they were cooking in the fire. He'd get burned. He'd nearly drown. And this had happened since he was a child for many years. They'd probably taken him to many doctors. They'd probably taken him to the priests and had uh, anointing services and do everything they could. But it just didn't get any better. And year after year, this father thought, how is my son going to live? How will he have a job? How will he find a wife, have a family? It, this is just tormenting him, nearly killing him when he'd have these dangerous seizures. And the story of the deliverance of this son is, of course, something that we all experience. Um, we're going to look at it now, point by point. First of all, I want you to notice that it tells us that Jesus said, um, this is apparently a hopeless case. Christ comes down from the mountain and he sees this devil in the valley. After being with the glory on the mountain, there's demons in the valley. And that's sort of how life is. After you have a mountaintop experience, you need to be careful. He asks the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. So it had been going on for a long while. And it tells us then that uh, he often has thrown him both in the fire and the water to destroy him. It's interesting, you've got these two opposite extremes. You know, you got fire that can come down from the sky in the form of lightning. We saw that last week and it started a bunch of fires. We actually saw lightning fires start. I think that's the closest I've ever come to seeing it before. And then we saw rain come down from the sky. Fire and water. Um, you can't live without fire. I mean, you know, you need it to cook. You need it for warmth. It's, a, it's very important. Most of you got to church today through fire. Little spark plugs blowing up inside your engine. If you've got a diesel, it still explodes through compression. You got a glow plug in there. I mean, we use fire all the time. It's a good thing when you're cooking. Uh, it's a bad thing if you fall into it. Uh, we need water. Um, drink it. Cook in it. Swim in it. Water's great, but you can also drown in it. And these two things, which seem like opposites, were destroying him. You know, uh, it's interesting that two opposite groups often came together to try to destroy Jesus. Pilate and Herod couldn't get along except when it came time to condemn Jesus. Then they became friends. The Sadducees and the Pharisees hated each other. In fact, Paul once used it to his advantage when he was being tried. And he looked around the room and the judges and he said, oh, some of these are Pharisees and some of these are Sadducees. Paul knew what to do. He said, yeah, I'm a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee, and I'm being judged because I believe in the resurrection. Instead of being mad at him, they turned on each other. You remember that story? But you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees could get along when it came to crucifying Jesus. And it's almost like you've got this bipolar experience, sometimes in the fire, sometimes in the water. It doesn't matter if you fall on the right side of the ditch or the left side. God told Joshua, when you follow me, he says, do not turn to the right or do not turn to the left. <laughs> there are people who fall into the ditch of conservatism. He can become a Pharisee and they fall into the ditch of liberalism or progressivism, whatever term you choose. But there's these extremes. And he, the father never knew when it was going to happen, but these fits would come over the boy and he suddenly had no possession of himself. And thrashing, beating, burning, drowning, and, and uh, just left the family probably exhausted, always afraid to take their eyes off of him. Whenever they were cooking dinner, they were washing by the river, that off he'd go. And it was just breaking their hearts. Finally, the father, he hears about Jesus. And the disciples had been out casting out devils and working miracles. And they think, maybe if we could bring him to Christ. Well, they get to the disciples and Jesus has disappeared up the mountain and they don't know. And the disciples say, no problem. Jesus has given us authority to cast out devils. And uh, so we can do it. And so uh, 
Maybe Andrew says, look, you know, I'm part of that inner circle. I'll do it. And he lays hands on the boys and he says, be healed. And he falls down and has another fit. So they said, well, that didn't work. And uh, then uh, Philip says, well, let me try it. Philip lays two hands on him and says a prayer. In Jesus' name. He said, you forgot to say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And the boy thrashes even more. And one by one, the other nine apostles who are there, they go through whatever they had learned from Christ to try to cast out this devil. And they're doing it by the book. Jesus had taught them. But it's no better. Now the scribes and Pharisees that are there, they are loving this. They begin to mock and they're laughing because they said, yeah, you trying to cast out devils through the prince of devils. You know, that's what they said to Jesus. And they're making the most of the disciples not knowing. And they're beginning to uh, cajole and insult them in front of the waiting crowd that has gathered. They're waiting for Jesus to come back. It says a great multitude was waiting for him. And so this has become quite a spectacle. And, and maybe Andrew comes along and says, let me try one more time. And every time the disciples try to pray and deliver the boy and it doesn't succeed, the scribes and the Pharisees mock even more and the crowd begins to mock and it's not looking very good. And that's why when Jesus finally descends from the mountain, he sees all this turmoil. There's a big debate going on between the scribes and the uh, Pharisees and the apostles and the crowd is split and polarized between who are we going to believe and the poor father. What is he thinking about? He's not thinking about the argument. He's thinking about, can anyone help my son? I came bringing my son. What a picture here. This is almost like the antithesis. You've got God the Father who brought his perfect son into the world. And then you've got this desperate father who's got his barely tormented son. And the two of them meet at the base of the mountain that day. And of course, Jesus delivers the one. It's what he did for that boy is what he does for the world. You know, that man needed hope. He needed encouragement. John Bunyan said, Hope has a thick skin. It will endure many blows. It will put on patience as a vestment. It will wade through a sea of blood. It will endure all things, if it be the right kind. For the joy that is set before it, hence patience is called patience of hope, because it is in hope that the soul exercises patience and long-suffering under the cross until the time comes to enjoy the crown. It's hope that keeps us going. And I imagine that day as the different apostles would try to cast out the, uh, the demon, and Andrew failed. Father could have said, oh, forget about it. I'm leaving. But Philip said, no, wait, let me try. He said, if there's hope, I'll let you try. And Philip fails. And then Bartholomew says, wait, let me try. And Bartholomew fails. And Nathaniel says, but wait, let me try. He says, if there's hope, I'll just keep coming if there's hope. You know, I, I've heard stories of parents that uh, they've got some afflicted child and out of love for that child, they, they take them around the world to all of these Catholic shrines where mir miraculous healings have ostensibly taken place. And they take them to Lourdes in, in France. And they, they take them to the, the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico and all these different sites where they say the Virgin Mary has appeared because these poor people, even though they're misguided, they're desperate. And so hope, it just keeps on taking, it's like an echo that keeps going ahead, takes one more step. And so that father, he just, he was waiting and waiting. And you think he'd finally reached his end. And after the disciples had once or twice all tried to deliver that boy, uh, they couldn't do anything. You know, sometimes it seems the church has no power. Have you ever wondered, where's the power in the church? Have you ever thought, how come we don't see the miracles like they saw in the days of the apostles? Well, be encouraged. There was even a day in the time of Christ when the church and the apostles looked powerless. That ought, ought to encourage you. Was the power still there? Yeah, it was still there. But sometimes they couldn't tap into it. So don't be discouraged that sometimes even God's agency, Christ had given them authority, the Bible says, over evil spirits. But, you know, it didn't work every time. And that doesn't mean that Christ had left his people. So we don't really find help in the church. 
the help is in Christ. You know, if we start trusting in the name of a preacher or the name of an apostle, that's not where the power is. What did Jesus ultimately say when they said, we've tried everything? He said, bring him to me. Sometimes we think the answer is in bringing him to a particular location or a building, but really the healing happens when we bring the problem to Jesus. So we've got to remember, friends, that uh, we cannot be deceived into thinking that a situation is hopeless. You know, as long as there's hope, people endure uh, a long time. I remember hearing about uh, years ago a man was on a, an ocean liner crossing the Atlantic and they got into some very rough water. So he went up on top of the deck and he was just really seasick. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on the ocean and you've been seasick, but it's not pleasant. And as long as the boat is rocking, you are sick. And you can't do anything. It's just, it'll incapacitate you. Yes, it can ultimately kill you after uh, long enough. And uh, this steward was walking by and he saw the man as the waves continued to get rough. He saw the man looking all pale and sickly laying out on a lounge chair up on top of the deck and he put his hand on his shoulder. He said, uh, don't worry, sir. You probably are not going to die. And he said, don't tell me that. It's only hope of death that's keeping me alive. <laughs> He's always got to have that hope. It is true that hope will keep a person alive longer. Did you know that? Doctors have proven many times that uh, if a person is struggling with a serious disease, if they have hope of healing, they are more likely to be healed or they are more likely to live longer. Hope is crucial. I forget what university it was did this test, and I know this is gonna sound really cruel, but this is what they did. They put these rats in a barrel of water uh, where the sides were steep, and they drop a rat in, and they couldn't get out, and all they could swim. And if the rat swam around, and he saw there was nothing he could reach to get out, then he might last 45 minutes and then he'd give up and he'd drown. Then what they did is they put a little ramp just outside of reach of the, the rat and they found that if the rat thought there was hope, they not only lasted twice as long, they swam twice as hard trying to reach the little ladder that was just outside of reach because if they had hope, they stayed al alive longer. It's so important that we don't lose hope because hope sometimes is what heals us. Hope itself is crucial in the, in the Christian experience. Some of you have struggled. You're wondering, is there any hope for my, uh, my marriage? You know, the Bible tells us where there's life, there's hope. And the same Jesus that uh, can save your soul, he can save your marriage. Whatever your challenges might be, you might be wondering about the hope for physical healing, the hope for deliverance from some sin or habit or addiction. You say, I've fallen so many times. Is there any hope? As long as there's life, there's hope. And you need to stay hopeful when a person loses hope. Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire comes, it is a tree of life. You know, uh, I remember hearing a story about uh, this kid that was in the hospital uh, and a boy was in a class and he was very sick and he was, uh, he had been seriously burned and they weren't sure if he was going to recover because uh, of the infection and uh, the family was thinking that he was losing hope that he was gonna live. And one of the uh, chaplains in the hospital heard about that and this was like an 11 year old boy and she said, I want you to send his math teacher in to talk to him. She said, you want the math teacher to go in? Yeah, I want you to send his math teacher to talk to him and I want his math teacher to tell him, sit by him and go over the assignments he's missed. And they said, you sure? Yeah. So the math teacher went in. It was actually hard to look at him because he was you know, still scarred pretty badly. And she sat down next to him and said, Willie, you've, you've been missing some homework and you don't have to get up or work on it, but let me just tell you the different uh, problems we've been working on and the, the math calculations and the different uh, uh, theories and formulas. And she, she went over some of his assignments. He said, just want you to be able to catch up with the other students for when you join us. 
And then uh, she left. Almost immediately, his condition began to improve and the infection began to subside. And uh, people were wondering what in the world happened. And he later said, you know, <laughs> I thought I was going to die. But when they sent my math teacher in, <laughs> said I thought, they must really think I'm going to make it. <laughs> if they're making me go over my homework and they, if they think I'm going to make it, there must really be hope. It's that simple. We've got to believe. Now, you know why these stories of these miracles are in the Bible? Even though the disciples failed at least nine times, the other nine apostles who had not gone up the mountain with Jesus, you know, Peter, James, and John were there. You take three from 12, you got nine. Even though the other nine had failed, the Father did not give up. And he turned to Jesus and said, if you can do anything. But you can tell that his faith is wavering because he does what? He uses that word that Jesus doesn't care much for. It's a two-letter word. He said, if. How did Jesus know it was the devil that came to him in the wilderness? He said, if you are the Son of God. And then there was a thief on a cross next to Jesus. One was saved, one was lost. The thief that was lost, what two-letter word did he use? If. He said, yeah, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us also. And... Um, Jesus said, if you believe, you can say to this mountain, be plucked up and be cast into the sea and it will be done. Now, we're not talking about moving mountains of dirt, but we all have different mountains. For this father, the mountain was the, the demon that was harassing his son and disrupting their world. For you, take your pick. You, do you know what your mountains are? Have you got a mountain you've been trying to move? struggle. He might be a mountain of debt for you. It might be a health problem. It could be a problem in relationships. It could be a problem in your own heart where you just have bitterness. It's a mountain you cannot forgive. Whatever those mountains are, with faith, all things are possible. This story is in the Bible not to talk about specifically healing an epileptic child. It's talking about deliverance from the harassment of hell. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands. I would expect every hand to go up. But if I were to ask you, have you been harassed by the enemy? Has Hades caused some problems in your life? Have you been walking along trying to follow Jesus and all of a sudden you have an epileptic fit and you don't know what came over you and you can't hear the voice of the Lord, you are deaf and you cannot speak the words of God, you are dumb. And this, this experience of this boy is the experience of every believer that we are all of a sudden taken by surprise. The devil catches us unprepared and tries to destroy us. You know, that's what it said. I don't know if you caught it, but in one of the gospel accounts it says, and he tries to destroy him. What does the devil want for us? He wants to destroy us. So Jesus comes down. The crowd is disputing. When he says, oh, faithless generation, you wonder, is he talking about the apostles? Maybe he's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees and the nation that would not accept him. Ultimately, the disciples did develop faith. And the father comes and he says, I'll tell you what the problem is. Father came kneeling. He said, this is my only son. I'm bringing my only son to you. And Jesus said, fair enough, God's giving his only son to you. And then he describes the problem. Now, when Christ said, how long has he had this problem? Did Jesus know? He knows. He asked that so he'd report it for our benefit, that it had gone on a long time. Maybe you've struggled with something for a long time, and you wonder, how can I ever be free? And he said, you know, if you believe, all things are possible. And it says, as the boy is coming, Jesus said, bring him to me. What do we do with our problems? The Bible says, bring we talked enough about the problem. Now let's talk about the answer. Jesus said, O oh, faithless generation, bring him here to me. Bring our problems to Jesus. Christ said, Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. So the Bible says, And they brought him. And as soon as the demon that is in this boy sees Christ, he goes into just a real show. As they brought him, he saw him immediately. The spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed. He's banging his head. He's foaming. They can't talk to him. His eyes roll back. 
Now, I just need to just make it clear that there are some people that have a medical form of epilepsy, and I'm not saying that any time a person has a seizure that it is a devil. Uh, whether it's physical or whether it's spiritual, I believe Jesus can heal all kinds of things. Amen? Jesus heals physical disease. He heals spiritual problems. So, but in this case, it tells us it's, it's a diabolical problem. You notice that as that demon knew that his time was short, he raged all the more. The Bible says Satan has come down to this world and he is full of wrath because he knows his time is short. And uh, this probably was the most severe convulsion that they had ever seen yet because the devil realized what was going to happen. Jesus had never failed to cast out a devil. And so he's carrying on. And while this is all happening, the crowd is gathering around. Jesus then asks the Father, how long has he had this problem? He's actually going to glorify the miracle. He said, this is, boy, it's all the way back. Started happening as he was a child. We were so proud of this beautiful baby boy. He had all this promise. And then these seizures started happening. And they got worse and worse. And he's been injured so many times and nearly drowned and nearly burned. And if you can do anything. Now, faith is crucial when you come to Jesus. He said, if you can do anything. You notice what he says? He says, have compassion. Have pity. Is God compassionate? Is he merciful? He says, have pity on us. And Jesus caught that word. Now, he could have just said, sorry, I can't help you. You said if. But Jesus knew the Father had hope, or would he be there that day? He wouldn't have even been there except he had hope. He had some faith, and this is exactly what the Father says. Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible. And immediately, without hesitating, the Father, knowing that this is a criteria, he promises Jesus, he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, is it possible for us to have some belief and some doubt at the same time? Yeah, let's, come on. I think all of us say, you know, we're here because we believe, but we also sometimes struggle with unbelief. Uh, I think that's true with every believer. The devil is constantly trying to get us to have doubts. Matter of fact, there's a wonderful chapter in that book, Steps to Christ, What to Do with Doubt, because every believer is plagued with doubts sometimes. And then Jesus looked at them, and he said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Jesus said, If you believe, all things are possible. How many times does Jesus say that? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. Luke 1, 37, For with God, the angel told Mary, nothing will be impossible. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It is in the presence of hope that faith is born. And so Jesus said, If you have faith, you can move these mountains. Nothing is impossible for God. So then when Jesus saw the people coming, the Father said, I believe, help my unbelief. Will Jesus answer that prayer? Have you ever prayed for something and you th said, Lord, I believe, but I've also got doubts. What do I do? Can you pray so, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief? Did Jesus answer that prayer for the Father? He does. He sees the crowd coming. He thinks, well, this I better deal with this before it gets out of hand. And he says then, Deaf and dumb spirit. Now, this is the only place where it uses the word deaf and dumb. It's actually in the words of Christ. That means when he went into his seizures, he wasn't normally that way, but when he was in a seizure, he couldn't speak, he couldn't hear. Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him, and here's the great part, enter him no more. You know, Jesus wants to set us free. <laughs> what good would it have been if he had saved him for 15 minutes? I mean, if you pray for healing, you want it to be permanent, don't you? He says, uh, come out of him and enter him no more. You can read in Matthew 12, 45, talks about a demon that goes out of a man, but because the man doesn't replace it with something better, that demon gets seven other devils worse than himself and comes back, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. You want to be saved and have the devil come back no more. Jesus healed people. And he said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. No more. He wants us to be free indeed. John 8, 36, if the Son makes you free, 
you shall be free indeed. He wants it to be complete and absolute. Told the woman in the temple, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The Lord wants to save us from our sins. He doesn't want us to keep having these seizures of sin. Now, are you getting the point of the story? We lost control and the devil took over and I think all of us is, have experienced that. And the disciples then later, when they're by themselves with the Lord, they're feeling a little sheepish. By the way, I've got a theory. Are you wondering why my Mark goes into more detail in this story than Luke or Matthew? When every other time Mark is the one who is the most brief, Mark is largely the gospel of Peter. It was dictated probably by Peter. Peter was with Jesus on the mountain that day. Peter felt no guilt about not being able to cast out that devil. He wanted to tell the whole story. The other apostles said, let's just make this short as possible because <laughs> it was a terribly humiliating experience for them. Now, I can't prove it, but that's my theory about why Mark, for one time, goes into more detail than the, than the other gospel writers. They said, Lord, why could we not cast him out? Where did we go wrong? He said, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, you know what that means? You and I can pray right now in 10 seconds. How many of you can fast in 10 seconds? Well, I think most of you have been fasting since you've been here. Can you call it a fast? Well, if you want to. That's not really fasting. Typically, fasting takes a little longer, doesn't it? Whether it's a, a meal or a day or something you're fasting from for a while to deny yourself. But... Um, I like the way that Spurgeon put it. Prayer links us to heaven. Fasting separates us from earth. Prayer brings us to the banqueting table of heaven. Fasting overturns the gluttonous table of earth. One strengthens the spirit. The other subdues the flesh. So when he says that this victory can only come through prayer and fasting, you know, I, I know I'll probably get some letters on this, friends, but I, I know a lot of Christians, modern Christians, that don't fast at all. And I wonder if you can be a real Christian if you've never fasted. Jesus didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. Uh, fasting has to do with the denial of self. You know, if you read in Romans 8, it's talking about denying the flesh. Romans 8, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We're constantly going through a battle between the Spirit and the flesh. Fasting is basically your way of saying, God, by your grace, I am going to deny the flesh. Now, you know, you may have low blood sugar and you got to consult your doctor, and I'm not recommending anybody passes out, you know, because you've gone days without eating and, and you don't know what your limitations are. Most of us, could survive a meal. Um, more of you than you think, if you had to, you could survive days without eating. Um, some of you might try fasting. You ever thought of a faith, Facebook fast? <laughs> Our technology fast? A television fast? Have you heard of that? Daniel, when he got a little older, he was fasting for 21 days. He said, I ate no pleasant food. He ate very small amounts and very simple food. Keep his strength up, but still denying the flesh. Uh, some of us would be well to just cut our portions in half and do a fast and say, we're going to draw close to the Lord. What you're doing is you're denying the flesh and you're showing heaven is more important to you. Sometimes we've wondered, Lord, I've, I've prayed about this problem for years and how come I haven't had victory? Have you fasted and prayed? And it may be something that takes a while. You may have to do it several times, is what the Lord is telling us. You know, the other thing we learn about this is the disciples could cast out some devils, but not this one. You know, we seem to read in the Bible, God has angels of varying rank. Do you believe that? Yeah. I mean, Gabriel seems to outrank some of the others. The uh, Bible talks about these mighty angels you read about in Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel. talks about seraphim and cherubim. Well, the angels that followed Lucifer may also have varying rank and power. 
And this particular angel that decided to set up shop in that poor boy that was tormented was a powerful problem. And that's why Jesus cast him out because Jesus could cast out the devil himself, that man who possessed, he got those 2,000 devils that possessed the man on the shores of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Jesus cast him out. That means that there is no case too hard for the Lord. Amen? Don't lose hope, friends. Yeah, you may need to fast and pray, but all things are possible with the Lord. I remember reading a um, Victor Frankl. He was a, a German, uh, he was a, a believer who was in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II, and he, he became a psychiatrist, and he said uh, he observed that there was a distinction between the ones who survived the concentration camp and so those who didn't. And he's not just talking about the ones who were executed. Among the ones who had to just abide the disease and the starvation. He said the ones that had hope survived. Now, after World War II, Frankel went around. He gave many talks about what it was like in the concentration camps. He said, what kept me alive is he said, I told myself when this is over, people will not believe what happened here. I need to live and tell others what happened here so that it never happens again. And he would tell his audience, you think this is my first time here? He says, I've been here a hundred times before. When I was in the camps, I saw myself standing before you telling the story. And because I saw myself telling the story, that hope kept me alive that people were going to hear the truth. Hope is crucial in survival. I just, uh, I've been reading a lot of great books lately. I like true history. I like the true adventures. And if you've never read the book if you want to hear an amazing story it's called the endurance it talks about the shackleton expedition that took place ernest sir ernest shackleton with his 26 men tried to make it down to the south pole actually they were going to hike all the way across the antarctic and they got shipwrecked they spent like two days locked in the ice living on icebergs pieces of ice flow floating around and it's an incredible incredible story of how they were whittled down from having an abundance on the ship to living in tents, to using up all their supplies. Yeah, they had to eventually eat the, the sled dogs. And then they uh, were just trying to capture seals and nearly getting eaten by sea lions. And just an amazing story. Finally, they realize they're going to die if they don't get to this solid rock called Elephant Island. And they make it through just an incredible storm of icebergs and get the, the 26 men land on this island and it's just a little piece of beach is all they have. It's like 100 feet long, sandy beach, the wind constantly blows, there's no shelter anywhere. They're hiding under their lifeboats is the only shelter, living off of seals and whatever they can, they can get on the shore. Shackleton says, we're going to die if we stay here. There may not be a whaling boat that comes by here in 10 years. So he takes six men and he says, we need to go, I forget, it was like a thousand miles to South Georgia Island across the ocean. He says, we're going to have to leave 22 of you here. We're going to try and make an impossible voyage in the worst sea in the world. The most dangerous, the coldest, stormiest ocean in the world in this little bitty 22-foot boat. Um, try and get help. We'll be lucky if we can find the island with our primitive navigation equipment. We're going to try and cross that ocean and come back. And he said, but men, you know, I've kept you all alive thus far. Don't lose hope. Now, there was one guy in the group who was the most negative guy in the group. And he was constantly complaining. And Shackleton had to discipline him a few times because he just was always sowing discord. <laughs> and when Shackleton left, he told that guy, he says, you're coming with me. He said, I don't want you staying behind and making the others lose hope. He actually didn't say that until later. But uh, he knew that if I leave this guy back, who's just the most negative one in the bunch, and he left a couple he wanted to take because they were good sailors, but he thought they're the most optimistic. They've got good attitudes. They need to keep hope because I don't know how long they can last, but they'll last longer if they have hope. So I'm hoping this plane will go by. <laughs> I'm trusting it will. <laughs> so they get in this little boat, and he's got the best 
navigator with him and a couple of hardy seamen and an old grumpy. There's like six of them. And they take off and they get through just virtual hurricanes. As a matter of fact, they survived a hurricane that took down a 500-ton ship. And they're in this little 22-foot boat. And they make it incredibly. After two weeks, constant cold and rain, they had to chip the ice off the boat because it was just like an iceberg when the rain blew and constantly in danger of capsizing. Their seal skin blankets that they slept in, this hair rotted right off and they were sleeping in all this fuzz in their mouth and their eyes and everything. It was just miserable existence. Karen's saying, too much. No, I want you to know. Guys, don't you like this part? Yeah, the guys like it. No, the girls. It was awful. Yeah, the guys are going, all right, good. Yeah, give us more detail. And so finally they land. They find the island. They land on the wrong side of the island. And the storm will not let them go around to where the whaling station is. And they have to go across these mountains, these like Arctic mountains in the snow. And with just, they got 50 feet of rope. And, but they wouldn't give up because they kept thinking, those men, if we perish, they perish. The, there are no radios back then. The only way that anyone's going to know is if we make it. And that just kept them going. The hope of saving others kept them going. And there was one time when they were freezing to death on top of the mountain, and they said, only way we're going to live is if we quickly descend. But they couldn't see over the edge of the cliff, and the three of them got a hold of each other and jumped. And they tobogganed. <laughs> they ended up sliding down the ice thousands of feet uninjured. It was just a miracle. But they knew that they said they had to take a literal leap of faith to survive. They come dragging into this whaling camp, and the whalers, there's nobody that shows up this part of the world, and they're wondering, who is this? They realize it was Shackleton, who's now virtually skin and bones. And after just a day or two of resting, he says, we've got to go get my men. And he's ready to get back on a boat and go back and rescue his men, because he knew where they were. First, they're turned back by the terrible weather. I told you, it's a miracle they made it in this little boat. Second ship, turned back by terrible weather. They left their men in April. It wasn't until August that they were able to get back, and he was just wondering, would any of them still be alive after three months living on that frozen shore, wind constantly blowing, virtually no shelter? But the men said, you know, if anyone in the world is going to make it and come back for us, it'll be Shackleton. He will not give up. If there's any hope that he made it, he will come back for us. And that hope is what kept them alive. Can you imagine the joy? Every day they would go out for three months. Well, they waited the first few weeks. They'd know he's not there yet. But after they figured he made it, they gave him about four weeks to come back. Then they started watching the shore for two months every day. Someone was constantly watching for any sign of approaching help. And can you imagine the joy when they looked out there one day and they said, there is a ship. And then they said, is it passing by or is it our ship? And they saw they were coming back for him. That's what kept them alive, hope. God wants us to have that hope. And who is ultimately our hope? Jesus. First Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Psalm 37, uh, Psalm 39, verse 7, and now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Jesus is the one who's going to get us through, and he can deliver us from uh, the devils that cause those seizures of sin, whatever the problems are in your life. But we must have faith. He says, if you believe, all things are possible to him that believes. If you want to say, Lord, I'm coming with my faith. I want to believe. We're going to stand together and sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, and, and then we'll have our prayer at the end. sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him all Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just. To
Thank you, Michelle and Jolene. You believe that Jesus can uh, save you from whatever the problem, whatever the seizures of sin that we battle with? If he hears the prayer of that Father, will he hear our prayers? He can work these miracles. His power has not changed. It's still the same today. Don't give up. Sometimes it may seem that some apostle fails or you bring him to the church and it didn't happen. Keep hoping and keep praying and fast and pray and he can do mighty things for you. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this promise in your word, this story, a very important story of how you, our Father in heaven, so loved us, you sent your son, and that he took upon himself all the sins of the world, of every individual, that we might be forgiven and have new life and new power to be your children. Bless each person, and I pray you'll be with those who are here and those that are watching during these... Uh, just these uh, climatic times we're living in, Lord. We pray that you'll keep our hope strong and our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Happy Sabbath.